We invited Lou Pulsifer, who is an icon in the gaming industry, so we're very happy to have Lou on. And um, Lou comes all the way from the travails of Gainesville now. He's living up there. So please welcome Lou Pulsifer. Welcome, sir. Hopefully you'll take us off in some odd directions today. So, so welcome. You would like to talk about... He's got, he is prepared. Oh, this is how you do it, James. What is this? It's like an outline? Oh, wait. Preparation? You prepare? That's incredible. Wow. Okay. So you're going to talk about old school and new school gaming in RPGs, correct? Yes. Is this working? It is working. Okay. You are being heard out in the interwebs. Now the question is, the, the question is, Lou, you had mentioned before we came on, you were evaluating Dan's DMing. So yeah, but that, that comes later. Oh, oh great. Later. That's like okay. the big finale. All right. No, so, the, so let's great. talk about well, old versus we, new. We can talk about old school and new school in general, and then whatever right. comments or objections, and then I can talk about right. the doubtful person. Wow. The what person? Doubtful. I'm the doubtful person? Oh, I don't even know what this means. I'm very, <laughs> James, I'm very uncomfortable. That's it. I'm very uncomfortable. Okay. So what, does, what is, what do you, how do you define old versus new school play? Well, this is going to take a while, I'm afraid. Um, first of all, this was the question that the guys asked me to talk about a couple years ago when I was going to come, and then COVID happened. Um, so how to design, the, I think it was Dan who said, I would think a talk on how to design or key elements of an old school tabletop role-playing game that are essential. So we'll try, but there's never a definitive answer to this. Every time you talk about it, you think of other things and so on. This is not a new idea, old school, new school. It's been with us before RPGs existed. Um, but it's usually spoken about in connection with RPGs. But you can think in hobby games that uh, the new school was partially manifested in party and family games. And the old school was manifested in the people who played war games. And then there was everybody in between. So it's called old in RPGs because it comes from a long time back. Um, and because the people who originally played RPGs were war gamers almost entirely. Right. So they understood it as a war game. Now we have probably the majority of people who play are non-war gamers, and often they're not gamers at all. And of course, that's why they're called new. They're often interested in stories, not really in games. And you look around this convention, the people playing RPGs are mostly um, old. Old. Well, on our side. Now, I don't know if you noticed on the other side. I did notice that. Yeah, there are, there are to your point, there is definitely a skewed, right. younger skew but, over there. But what happens, uh, this is like... Uh, scientific theories. People have pointed out that scientific scientists don't so much adopt a new theory as the guys who support the old theory retire or die. And then the new theory becomes the common one. Well, that's happening in old school and new school. The old school guys are retiring or not playing anymore or dying and so on. Right. Uh, and when you get to my age, which is 71, you know people you used to play with who are no longer with us. That's just the way it is. Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, but that's the way it is. So, what is the number one key essential factor in old school? It's failure. You can fail. Now, fail doesn't necessarily mean die, character death, but frequently it will. It's a game. You can lose a game. You can't lose a story, especially if somebody else is telling you the story. If you can lose, it's not a game. It, it, it becomes a game and not a story. So, you can fail in a game, but not when you're being told a story. Now, another aspect of this is earning versus participation. In an old school game, you have to earn the success that you achieve. In a new school game, you're rewarded for participation, which, again, if you think about it, is like family games, uh, and especially party games. Everybody's supposed to have fun in a party game, whether they win or not, and, and most people don't care whether they win. It's the game itself that's supposed to be fun. Another way of right. thinking of this is consequence versus reward. What you do in an old school game is consequential. 
it makes a difference to what happens. In a new school game, you're rewarded for being there and doing things, whether what you do is right or not. And of course, again, there's all kinds of in between. Can you fail? That's the bottom line. Now, another aspect of, of old school is it's group orientated. You're playing for the good of the group, not the individual. There's no need to let each person shine each game. I see those comments a lot on Ian World where I write a column called Worlds of Design. Some people just feel that the whole purpose of the game is to let everybody have a good time regardless, every time. And that's not old school, and I'll talk some about why that's tr true later. Um, so you don't let people, don't necessarily let everyone shine or do something cool or feel like a big deal. Now they may, but that doesn't have to have happen every game and you're not, as a GM, trying to make that happen. I've watched games, which I call All About Me D&D, &D, where literally... What edition GM, is that? All About Me D&D? &D? All About Me D&D. &D. Yeah. Um, literally, the GM would go from one player to another and each player had their own story in mind and so he'd work with that player for a while while everybody else watched. Oh. And then he'd work with the next player while everybody else watched and so forth. Now, that can happen in old school, but it's quite rare. If it happens in old school, it's because somebody's got really good ideas or they're a really powerful character, perhaps. But not because that's the way the GM does it and everybody gets to shine. Well, Dan and I are running a 12-man or woman or person basic game. So we'll, we'll let each person talk for five minutes. And so that means someone will do something once an hour. That'll, be, that'll make it a lot easier. That'll be great. That was a joke. Sorry. OK. I'll keep that was quiet. a joke. Good. <laughs> so, the games are cooperative rather than individualistic. There's no one-man army individualism. Now, third edition D&D was very much one-man army. And that was partly because there were only four characters in the group, officially. Um, fourth edition was much more cooperative. And that was partly because there were so many powers that buffed somebody else. And that's all they did. So you had to cooperate. Now, keep in mind, in the United States, we have a big problem with individuals who are happy to thumb their noses at the community in a variety of ways. And when people play games, they're happy to do things that are um, self-centered and not worry about anybody else. That's just the way people have been brought up. It's partly the triumph of capitalist advertising. You can look at it a lot of different ways. OK, now, stories. Every game has a story, but who makes the story? That's the difference in old school and new school. In old school, you let the players make their own story, which is also how you design most board games. Right. So um, as GM, you set up a situation. You don't impose a story on the other players. There should be objectives, of course, which often come from the players, not from the GM. For example, I, as the player, tend to think of what's going on as a war between good and evil. Well, a lot of people don't think that that way, especially new schoolers kind of are out for themselves. But th that happens in old school as well. As with any game, and unlike puzzles, the players decide how to get there. That's the key. So that goes on to let players decide, player agency. Old school games are often about exploration or about finding and identifying the objectives and then recognizing when something about a location or opponent makes it too dangerous to do right now. That doesn't happen in new school. Everything's set up so that it'll be okay for the party that you've got. So in old school, players have to decide to say no sometime. Now that puts a greater onus on the players and not everybody likes that. And remembering that ultimately we're entertaining. Right. Some people don't like any challenge in their entertainment. So you can't blame people. It's a difference in how you see your entertainment. Is it an intellectual challenge, which tends to be more old school? Or is it like watching a movie or watching a play where you're just passive? So let players provide the impetus and the decisions, not the GM. So be um, before you go on, we'll talk about agency, because we had movies. I mean, movies was the number one way to consume media for years. It was escapism, 
what has changed when you talk about old? Why did that passivity, as you talk about, where people are more interested in just kind of seeing the story unfold or have their character unfold I, versus... I think that's a consequence of having so many possibilities as opposed to, and you're going to hear this from an old guy, I had three television stations that were black and white on a 12-inch TV when I was a kid. Yeah. Now what do kids have? I mean, I find the internet and so on and so forth very distracting. What's right. it going to do to somebody who's just a formative stage? Um, so I think that's a lot of it. Also, the movies look a lot more real. And that makes a difference. And also, uh, the stakes in movies and comics and so on have moved up. For example, in the 30s, a comic book superhero would, would fight some gang, just a gang. And then it moved up to the point where nowadays you have to save the world or people, you know, oh, oh, yawn. Multiple it's worlds. It's jaded because so much is multiverses. Available. It's a jaded interest. And I like superhero movies, and I like Star Wars movies, even though they're dumb. But, you know, I don't uh, buy Star Wars toys and so on and get so too far into it. Great. Um, highs require lows. Now, what I mean, I'm talking about pacing, ultimately. If a session is always full of light and easy pickings, if you keep playing again and again and again that way, you're going to get bored of it. It's going to be tedious. And that's the reason why there's pacing in stories. You have low points and high points. Life is like that. Uh, we would rather not have the low points, but it makes the high points sweeter. Um, so, you can have brilliant adventures and scenes, but they're more brilliant if there's sometimes some dull ones and even some failures. For contrast, the old school accepts this, the new school does not. And that's a, a very basic point of view difference. You can have a dull adventure in old school and it's part of the game as a whole. If you have a dull adventure in new school, you fail somehow. Another difference is constraints, and much of what I'm talking about is really constraints. Any game is an artificial set of constraints, but contemporaries don't like constraints, and we could talk about the reasons why, but that tends to be the way it is. And oddly enough, that's why so many want puzzles. Well, puzzles, in a sense, are very, very constraining, but that's okay because you know when you do a puzzle, that's the only way to achieve it, that's the only way to do things, and so it doesn't bother you. In games, it bothers you. I remember um, reading about players who thought that secret doors were a dirty GM trick. A dirty trick. They wanted everything to be clear about where they were going and what they were doing. Well, okay, some people can be that way, some people aren't. So old school has lots of constraints. Two that are obvious are alignment, which is a big constraint if it's run properly, and level limits for certain species. And I say species rather than races. They're not races, they're, you know, an elf is, is a different race, a different species from a human. But we have the bad habit of calling them races. Um, the possibility of failure is itself a huge constraint. So typically in a new school game, they get rid of alignment, or they don't, they ignore it. They get rid of uh, level limits for species. And that's a game design, there's a game design purpose to that, and it messes the game up. But they don't like the constraint. There's much less hand-holding in old school games. You know, well, I'll help you along, give you a lot of hints. Modern video games are often about hand-holding, and you have to face it, younger people especially very frequently play video games more than they play tabletop games. It varies. Um, I surveyed two uh, tabletop game clubs, primarily board gamers, and on average they played video games more hours than they played tabletop games. Um, in video games, the developers are never supposed to let a player feel lost. Always let the player know what they need to do next. The old school players have to be allowed to go the wrong way, they have to be allowed to gather information or choose not to gather information. It's their choice. 
that comes back to player agency. What are the players going to do? And I've had people who played in my games, they'd go somewhere else and they'd run into a monster. They'd say, oh, we got to run away. Everybody would look at him like he was crazy because they were used to something where always the, the challenge was set to what they could do with a little help from the GM. That's not the way it is in old school. Now, about combat, and again, old school games tend to have a lot of combat. Not always. It's about stratagems and about war rather than sport. So, old school is about behaving like you might, your character might die. You rely on stratagems, which is to say trickery. You treat fighting as a war. If you fight a fair fight, you screwed up. Never give a sucker an even break. All's fair in war. So oftentimes, a fight in an old school game will be a massacre because that's what you want. You don't want to fight them straight up because you might die. But in new school, you're not going to die. So let's have a fight. Hack them up. Ha ha. So new school can treat battles like they were a sporting event except a sporting event, they almost always win. Maybe always win. So, um, we could summarize those points as make it a game so that players can fail. Uh, it's about playing a game first and a story second. Make players earn what they achieve. It's for the good of the group, not the individual. Encourage cooperation. Of course, if it's a game they can lose, they're much more likely to cooperate. I played D&D &D once in London, like in 1970. No, not 1980. Um, and the GM liked to see the players fight each other. Interesting. So the monsters were very minor. And we spent the whole time, it was a pickup game, watching the other players, which was tedious for me. But they liked it. It wasn't dangerous enough that they had to worry about anything but the other players. Never again. Encourage cooperation, let players decide. Highs require lows, more constraints, much less hand-holding, and stratagems war not sport. So that's the end of that. And before we discuss our esteemed king here, <laughs> Uh, Any questions? Co oh, pardon me, co-emperor. Emperor now. Co Not even kings. That's an empire. Oh, okay. So you have subordinates, subordinates or a king. Rob's a king, right? He can be. His patron level is not sufficient. Wait. The whole patron level. So you, you wait on bribes to see who's going to be king. Very few. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> is this wrong? Yeah, we have a pamphlet. Talks all about yeah, it. Yeah, there was a lot of that. There was a yeah, lot so of that. The yeah. only yeah. thing we haven't done is had the multi-level you know, tier thing where, because we're greedy, we're collecting all the money ourselves. We could have it where we could give the contents to someone else and then they would have it. So even I could not be a king because I'm not bribing you. Correct. Well, there are honorary. Oh my, are, oh my God, oh my are, God. There are honorary titles. Yes, but it'll have an asterisk next to it. Right. <laughs> So, so what, what questions or comments do you have about this so far? I do have questions. I'm sure the audience may have questions as well. Um, so you had mentioned agency. You mentioned that, uh, you know, that players old school have agency. Sorry, yes, the thing is not working. I don't know why. Um, but again, I, I think the thing for me is we, those issues where people like a story, I mean, when the first Dragonlance came out, the uh, Dragonlance of the Dragons of Despair, that was, to me, a sea change in how it was. That was, you know, it felt like you were on a ride. I mean, I loved Tracy Hickman's Fair Eye series. All those were good, but they started adding more elements of plot scenes and this and that. But that one was the first one where, you know, you couldn't kill this, this character couldn't die, and you had to wait for certain things. So, plot armor. Why? Oh, there you go. Magically, I think the Yeah, I don't know what's going on. So, um, what, what is 
there a, is there a date or a time frame that old school became new school? Because you mentioned that number of positions. Well, of course not, because there's so many people involved. Uh, what what would you take as a, a boundary where maybe the uh, new schoolers became to outnumber the old schoolers? But who, who can know that? There's no way to know. It's a gradual thing, just like a lot of things that happen in human history. Gradually, you had fewer people playing old school way and more people playing the new school way. Do you think that modules, commercial modules, played a role in this? Because commercial modules, which you know, I think Gary originally didn't think modules would sell or a good idea. He figured people want to write their own adventures. Uh, modules, of course, have to be, in a sense, very linear, very objective-based. You can run it, hopefully, in, in six hours. Do you think that played a role in, ter in heading toward new school? Well, I'll say this. I think modern modules are often written to be entertaining stories because most people who buy them are not going to run them. And why is that? Because there are so many around, and there's 40-plus years of accumulation of modules yeah, I don't buy any modules. Why would I? I've got hundreds. And there are lots and lots that are free. You just have to look for them. So why buy a module? But other people like to buy the modules, and I think they're designed to uh, be interesting stories to read. Now, I'm going to take an example from Spelljammer that just came out. I love Spelljammer, and I was fairly disappointed with the new Spelljammer but especially with the adventure that's in New Spelljammer. It is linear, on the rails it's called. Do this, do this, do this. There are a few cases where it can divert, but then it's brought right back in, all through 12 sessions to a particular result. That's New School all the way. When did that come out? Just now. Um, a month ago. Right, pretty, pretty, the New yeah, Spelljammer pretty yeah. recently. Yeah, the new one. So, so, Lou, you also mentioned about video games and the influence obviously had. For, for me, I stopped playing D&D in the late 80s because video games were easier to play. You didn't have to try to wrestle a group up and deal with drama. But they were still fairly linear. I didn't find that as an, uh, an advantage. I thought that was, well, the, the technology will get better and better and it'll become more immersive in this the AI will, the, of the, D, the DM, the virtual DM, will just get better and better. It still hasn't gotten there. I mean, the worlds keep getting more and more open, but ultimately there's, you can't do everything. Not every uh, permutation of choice is in there. So, right. and you, there's also a trend of people playing this game called Dark Souls. I don't know if you've heard of Dark yeah. Souls, but it's, yeah. it's a hardcore game. It's very reminiscent of the old. So there is still a cadre of people. So, so it's, it's, there, there is both now, but, and you're not saying it's exclusive old school, new school, but it's just that a lot of folks who were not in the hobby because they didn't, these attributes were old school, in order to attract a bigger following, they've had to incorporate some more mass media kind of things to make it passive. Is that a fair assessment of what you're saying, or is that, did I miss the mark? Well, it always depends on what players you can get. I think that players generally are much more passive. Uh, imagination is not valued very much and I'm not talking about brain fever, I'm talking about imagination that helps you solve problems. Right. And that's because everything is imagined for you. And in board games, there's this attitude that uh, you can't change the game. It's sort of like the, the corporation or publisher who, who published it owns the game and you should only do what they say. That's board games. Well, I think some of that leaks into RPGs as well. Plus, people don't have the time, perhaps, to make their own modifications. Plus, there's so many things, like flipping and turning, where you can get modifications. But um, the result is people are more passive. And, and there's a lot of other reasons for that. But they're willing to have things happen to them rather than making things happen. Old school is about making things happen. Now, even in old school game, it's not bad to have a few passive players. It was always good to have somebody who just wanted to be a fighter give me a weapon and point me in the right direction and that was quite useful because being a fighter is not very interesting because there's not a lot of options right they've, they've tried in various rules to make it more interesting but essentially you go out and hack things or shoot them with arrows or whatever um, so it's fine to have passive players in a game as long as you've got some active ones if you have a bunch of passive players 
in an old school game, they're probably going to get cut up. If you have a bunch of active players in a new school game, they're going to get really frustrated. I call it being led around by the nose because you have to do what's supposed to happen to, for the story. Bullshit. So it depends on what players you've got. And it's harder to find active players than it used to be simply because of the way society works. Yeah, and I, it's interesting. There's, I think their focus, at least, again, play, I, I play in Tom's game, who's back here. Thank you very much. And we're very old schoolish. I play another friend's game, but I run uh, a, a new edition game for my sons because they're younger. And, but they've played for, they played old school. So they, they still treat it that way, but their friends, when they bring them in, they're active, but they're active in, not in the story. They're active in how their character interacts with the plot lines. They want to be very active in the downtime adventure part. They want to be active in fulfilling their backstory. They, it's, they want to be active in those areas of how I can be super cool. I mean, yeah, and then you still have some of them who want the, to do the multiple combo. You know, they read online that if they put this proficiency in this and this class, then they can do, you know, 300 points of damage. And, right, which is, we've been doing that for a, a long time. But the part I still see some activity is in the downtime. They're like, Oh yeah, you can. I want to set up a, a shop. Okay, great. You set up a shop. Well, what kind of shop can I set up? Um, well, in my backstory, I my family was a bunch of cheese makers, and and I would like to set up a wine thing next to my fa father's house, who's a third. And we're spending 45 minutes talking about something that's going to make eight gold pieces. You know, from a mechanical perspective, it's producing eight gold pieces. But they want me to sit there and come up with. The type of cheese and, and, and whether the, you know, the, the milk was from a certain cow and that kind of thing. See, and I say, what's a backstory? I don't do backstories. Right. Well, and you let the character develop in the game and, and get and the story from And you and I, we 100% agree with that. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, with the addition that shall not be named, you, there's benefits, there's mechanical benefits to coming up with the backstory. Yeah. So that's why yeah. they do it. Well, fifth edition can be played as old school. Yes. But there's so many... Uh, parts of the game that make it really hard to die uh, that it by nature perhaps it's sort of new schoolish now somehow I missed talking about this I think how much difference do the rules make to whether it's old school or new school well it can make a difference if you've ever seen and read the rules for fate yeah. where you're just sort of making things up with some die rolls to modify that's going to tend to new school. And where you have something like old D&D, first edition D&D, that's going to tend to old school. But notice third edition D&D, where they put in the skills, and fourth edition especially, what the passive players wanted to do is just roll, roll for my diplomacy, roll for my intimidation. They didn't want to role play that kind of thing, which in a sense simplifies the game, but it's not the traditional way to do it. Traditional old school way to do it. You talk it out. Maybe there are some dice rolls, but there's no skill about this, that, or the other thing. Could you talk about the DMs and the different skills a DM needs to DM old school versus new school? Because and I can tell you as a DM, when it's sort of just a sandbox and players are going all different directions, that's a challenge for, for the DM. So are there different skills? Well, the obvious one is the GM has to be a storyteller if he's in new school. And most people aren't at all that good as storytellers. You know, I usually say if I want to read a story, I'm going to read it from a professional who's done it for years and is good at it. Why, right. why bother with this random GM? <laughs> you know, some GMs right, are going exactly. to be really good storytellers, but a lot of them are not. Um, on the other hand, some GMs are not going to be very good at uh, tactics in combat. Um, my wife used to get frustrated when she GM'd, and I'll put a point in here, I met her through a D&D game. Yes. 40 some, 45 years ago. Um, I was very lucky. I'm good. She doesn't, like she doesn't. Lily, you want some water? Uh, no, thanks, I'm fine. I'll take um, a water. I'll take water. Thanks. She doesn't play anymore, though. Oh, well. She retired. 
<laughs> is she old? She got, huh? Is she old school or new school gamer? Well, she learned from me, and I'm old school. <laughs> um, but she got frustrated when we would do some stratagem or some really good strategy and just snuff the bad guys because she thought she wasn't holding up the side. Ah. And she's British, English, so she used that phrase that she wasn't doing well enough. She'd get to tears because of that. Hmm. Because she wanted to hold up the side and make it tough. But that's not the nature of old school. Sometimes if the players are good, they're going to smush the bad guys. Right. And that's that. Um, it's not that she was bad at tactics, but I don't think she was particularly outstanding in any way. Um, so those are two differences. Um, a new school GM has to be good at thinking of little things for the players to do, little accomplishments that are not combat oriented. On the other hand, an old school GM who like Dan doesn't like combat has to work really hard to figure out ways to endanger the players without combat. And you had something like that in one of the games you ran yesterday, the teleport that did damage if people used it. So that was their choice. It was perfect for somebody who doesn't like combat. Sign said out of order. Right. They were warned. Yep, yep. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> you know, I remember, God knows, it was a long time ago, um, several high school kids, including uh, Greg Kostiki, and who's very well known as a game designer now, um, they were playing D&D, and they were playing what I call button and lever D&D. So the GM would say, okay, your party walks into a room, there's a lever on the wall, what are you gonna do about it? Cha-ching! Of course. Right. <laughs> you have and to whatever it. happened, happened. Then they walk in the next room, okay, there's a button on the wall, what are you gonna do about it? Punch. <laughs> they were high school kids. And they knew that in general, <laughs> that more good things would happen than bad things. So what it did is it eliminated all the wandering around. It, it saved a lot of time in a sense, provided you were always willing to have encounters that might involve combat. Although it could be some NPC turn up and then you'd talk to them. Well, you know, that's a way to play D&D, &D, but it's not a way I've ever played because it, it sounds ridiculous. It, it's unbelievable. And I might say, interject here, old school, there are different ways to play old school, but some old school games are a lot more believable than most new school games, I would say. But that's part of the ethos coming up. I, I knew a young lady who was GMing, and her players wanted to throw an iron stove, and you know those are big and very, very heavy, throw it across a very large body of water. Oh, sure, I'll let you roll. If you get a 20, you can do it. No, there's no chance you can do that. I don't care how strong you are, there's no chance. But that didn't phase her. She was happy to do it. The players were happy to do the roll. Oh, you know, every once in a while you get lucky. That's, oh, that's new school, I think. Sounds fun. <laughs> I want to play. <laughs> you, so, like, you like randomness. <laughs> I'm a planner. Yeah. That's going to make a lot of difference. Yeah, so I want to, I, I, you, for those who did, weren't here last night, Lou was observing. He was like uh, the lead faculty watching uh, the DMs. Uh, yeah, it's like I'm, I'm up for like DM tenure. Right. And like I've got like, you know, the senior faculty is visiting and they're going to do a report out on whether or not I should get ten, so, DM yeah, the tenure. Ad admin came to your classroom and uh, observed, did an yeah. observation. He's very new school. So, and so with that, uh, Lou, uh, I'd l we, I know we'd all love to hear your perception of you guys don't want to hear. You don't want to. You guys don't want to hear about okay. that, do you? Yeah, first, yeah, yeah. Yes. First of all, I, I've become more aware of the difference between a campaign and one shots or one offs. The English would call them, and Dan was doing one offs. Thank you. That makes a big difference to start with, and then Rob pointed out that there are different kinds of one offs. There's ones you just play at a game club. There's ones you play at a convention. There's ones that you play for a tournament, and they're all different as well and we could probably think of more versions. The number one difference is it's short term, whereas I think old school is much longer term than short term, than, than new school. So he's running, I observed two adventures. They were gonna play, they were playing with characters they had no investment in, which is another big difference. You know, it was just characters that they were given. 
And um, when it got done, they'd be done. Well, you can tell a story in that context because stories fit one-off adventures pretty well. And you don't want a lot of combat because combat takes a long time, which is why Dan says he doesn't like it. So again, the ultimate question is, can they fail? And the GM has to come up with ways that they can fail other than combat if he doesn't like combat. That's pretty tough to me, but it becomes a very puzzly sort of game because puzzles substitute for the combat, which is more open-ended or should be more open-ended. I did notice that whenever there was combat in these two games, it was one monster only because Dan does not use figures or any, any representation for the characters. He does not use a board to represent maneuver, so there's no maneuver. Well, the heart of combat is maneuver, not doing damage. And many uh, people have observed over the years, going back at least 2,000 years, that really good generals win by maneuver, not by combat. They, they uh, do more with maneuver than with slaughter. Um, but you can't have any maneuver if everybody's against one monster. The only maneuvering is, I'm fighting them, I'm standing back, I'm running away. That's about it. Right. Um, okay. And also, that everybody fights one monster at a time makes it really dull. Because there's no way for the players... Well, there are fewer ways for the players to exert their skill. Because there's no maneuver, there's no trickery, it's just hack, hack, hack. So Dan is actually reinforcing his dislike of combat. <laughs> but when you don't have a maneuver area, it's much simpler to run the combat when there's just one monster. If there's two monsters, it's a problem. If there's a lot of monsters, how do you organize that? So that's called theater in the mind, and I've never used it, and I can't, it gives me the heebie-jeebies. But it's quicker, and it's simpler, and if you're not really interested in combat and interested in other things, then it makes sense. So, uh, again, does it, was Dan running old school games? Well, somebody got killed in combat because they were a, a magic user and something else dual class, and they weren't very high level, and they got into the fight, which they never should have done. Um, so they got dead. Oh, well. Um, Traps would be common in this. And I've never been a big fan of traps. I really dislike puzzles, but that's a personal thing. Yeah, but, you know, some people like puzzles, some people don't. And if they like puzzles, or if it works out as it did in a one, one shot, then that makes perfectly good sense. Um, now, let me see. Let, let me go back to my summary here. Um, was it a game? Well, I think the players probably could fail. Was it about the game first? I don't know. There was a story, but again, it's a one-off, and it's natural to have a story. But I think there were a lot of things the players could do, so I don't think the story was being imposed. Make players earn what they achieve. I think that was happening. For the good of the group, who knows? Um, there was a lot of interaction between the players, and at one point, I, I wrote this down because it was so funny. There was an, they were all evil, by the way. There was a cleric, fourth level cleric. I think he had another class. And the player, the character just died and he had a raised dead scroll. So they talked about using the raised dead scroll for several reasons and then said, oh, let's raise this guy. Even though that player had got a new character by then. So he cast the raised dead. He had a 25% chance of failing. He didn't fail. There was a 30% chance that the character would die from system shock. He didn't die. He didn't die. So the character was alive again. And then people looked it up and found out when you're raised from the dead, you're not worth a hoot for a long time. You can't be cured up and so on. You're just there. Well, the evil character who was supposed to be the leader as well says, he's useless. I take my mash and bash his head in and kill him again. <laughs> It was, it was classic. <laughs> Did you give him XP for that, Dan? Uh, oh, it, I it, asked that question, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's under consideration. <laughs> but of course, XP don't matter when you're playing a one-off. Right. Um, and, and 
He may not have done that if it was a campaign because he was losing the utility of that character for forever. But in a one-off, he did it because it was funny. Yes. Well, the, uh, so Lou, I really appreciate it. We're going to have lunch with Lou after this. We don't know exactly what that means. We're probably going to go to the pool bar, get some things. So if you want to hang out here more about game theory and game design, you're, you're talking to the expert here. So Lou, thank you f for spending time with us today. Thank you, Lou. And we'll see you at lunchtime then. And uh, always a pleasure.